This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. And welcome, welcome. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber here. If you're the host of the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. We're here for you. We're here for your pets. We want to answer your question. We had somebody in the waiting room. If, you're, if, you, are, if you are listening to us, give us a call back. Um, you can join us a couple of ways. You can always ring us on the phone the old-fashioned way. How do you like that? Ring us at 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. Better yet, on the app, PetLifeRadio.com, go into shows, click on Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff, and you'll be a long link sitting there for you to just click on. That's all you have to do is click on it, and it'll take you right into our show, and we can uh, you can join us live with your pet, hopefully in hand or on lap or next to you if it's like a 180-pound Pyrenean Mastiff or something, and um, you can ask away, pick my brain. So um, first of all, it's hot out there. I'm, we're, I'm here in LA. It's by eight o'clock this morning. It was already over ninety degrees. Yesterday I reached a high in the valley. We call it the Val. You're sort of you've heard that term, the Val girls. So uh, in the valley of one hundred and fourteen, and today they expect to go up to one hundred and nineteen in the in Palm Springs, California, one hundred and twenty-two. I mean, it is really hot out there, and um, I don't usually complain about the heat. Yesterday, even kind of in the shade, I had an umbrella up and I went to just read, just sitting, you know, it was a beautiful day. Let me say, it was almost too hot to be out there. It was crazy. And uh, anyway, for your pets, be careful if you are living in climates like we are and weather having, like we're having here in Southern California right now, not only do you have to worry about forest fires, which we see a lot of, I'm worried about our pets. Make sure they have shade, make sure they have plenty of water, not water that can spill over, um, make sure they have water that, that's solid, that, that's going to be there. And if you can bring them in to your homes, hopefully your home's recognition, bring them in. As a matter of fact, on my AirVet platform, I talked to two people yesterday. Both, listen to this, both were in hotel rooms because it was so hot in their homes and they didn't have air conditioning. They they were afraid for their pet. They rented a hotel. They took a hotel room. So that's how hot it is. When When you're willing to buy a hotel room and stay there for the night just for air conditioning, uh, you know it's uh, it's it's hot out there. Anyway, as many of you know, we like to peruse the news, the veteran news. What is going on in the vet world, in the pet world? Share it with you. You know, maybe if you guys understand a little bit more about what we have to go through. You know, we hear, we hear this all the time. I've I mentioned this before. People ask me why my license plate rim, and um, I'll explain what we get a lot as veterinarians. You know, I, we're someplace. I'm introduced to somebody. Hi, this is Doctor Jeff Werber. Or they hear someone calling me Doc. And someone will come up and say, so what's, what, what kind of doctor are you? You know, they're expecting to say, am I a cardiologist? Am I a, you know, a rheumatologist? Am I a surgeon? Am I an internist? I go, I'm a veterinarian. Oh, so you're not a real doctor. You want, really? So you want to kill them. So I have a license that says real doctors treat more than one species. You know, it's interesting. Their real doctors are the only ones that really know and bow down to veterinarians when they meet them because they know that it was tougher to get into vet school than it is med school. And there are a number of medical doctors, MDs walking the planet at this very moment that actually wanted to be vets, but couldn't get in or didn't get in. So um, next time you meet a veterinarian, well, you know, you're listening to this show, you're, on, you're subscribing to Pet Life Radio, you know what we do and how important we are and how tough it is to be what we are. But um, anyway, that's why. I joke about the word, the term real doctor. In fact, in vet school, it's got to the point where we used to call, we didn't call them MDs. We called them RDs, real doctors, <laughs> because they had the status of being real doctors. Unfortunately, we don't. We, we actually, we got lucky and we found uh, our diplomas in a Cracker Jack box. And, uh, and we said so we got to be veterinarians. So no, it is the best thing on the planet, but it is tough. So in fact, in fact, I think I've mentioned this before, is that when I lecture at my old high school, back to my own high school every year, to lecture on what they call career day. They have about over 150 professions represented. Uh, they give talks. It's an entire day. And um, I give about three talks to three groups. Every, each group has about 20 to 25 kids. And obviously, these, the kids sign up for what their interests are. And so obviously, you know, when you're in high school, there's a lot of interest in veterinary medicine. And it got to the point where I was, I used to be 
you know, an idealist. I, I still kind of am sometimes, but I realized I need to be a realist. So I start by saying, look, just, you know, when we leave here in 50 minutes, trust me, I'm going to be equally as satisfied and a feeling of accomplishment if I talk you out of veterinary medicine as much as I would if I talk you into it. And the reason for that is that I hear, here's a high schooler and, it, you know, it's like a great dream. A lot of people have the dream. I mean, when I was in, when I was in high school, the same high school, and I'm one of four kids and we were all bunched together. My mom had four of us in five years, a superstar. And, um, Three of us at any one time were in the high school. And in that era the, of the five era, but that's four years each, there were only four future veterinarians. That we're talking about 5,000 kids through going through those doors. And yet there were only four of us in our era to become veterinarians. So as I'm sitting here in a group of three groups of 20, say 20, 60 kids, 70 kids, the chances may be 0.1. I mean, it's, it's so small that I have to be realistic. And I realize that, you know, I got to let people know the facts. You're going to work your butts off. It's hard. You're probably going to get rejected. The average accepted student when I was at Davis applied three times. I applied four. I was rejected three times. So it is really, it's a challenge and you have to work your butts off. How much work experience you need to get into medical school? I mean, literally work experience, actually hands-on. Oh, it's going to help on your application. But the answer is none. In veterinary school, minimum a thousand hours. When I applied, because I took so long, I had three thousand hours. So it is really a challenge. So uh, if you know anybody who's interested, and they're in high school already, when I ask them, I say, "How many of you have already worked with a vet at a vet hospital, even volunteering, even cleaning crap from cages, anything?" And only two hands of the twenty go up. I go, I point to those two. I says, "You guys have a chance." And the others, nah. Unless you, unless they are like literally. 4.6 students, you know, like they get A pluses on everything. Uh, they do well in the test scores. Then, yeah, they may have a chance without a lot of experience. They look for experience. So if you know anybody who's a pre-vet, that is the most, in addition to the grades, and trust me, the grades are unfortunately really important. That's where I was lacking. But uh, work experience is very important. Anyway, Oregon State Veterinary School, the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is joining many others like Penn, like Cornell, like Davis, and they are now testing for COVID. And again, as we know, we are, we see so many different coronaviruses in our animals that it really wasn't that hard. And the testing labs are just overwhelmed. So they're going to the veterinary diagnostic labs now to do some testing. So that's great. So it just shows how, A, the medical issues are very similar, and we are helping them navigate through all of the tests that are coming in for those that might be COVID-19 positive. We call it the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's pretty cool. A woman in Tacoma, Washington is teaching her. It's a sheep poo. It's a poodle sheepdog cross. They're really cute, by the way. I, I see a couple of them in practice. And they're to communicate by pushing buttons that are associated with words. And the dog is doing pretty amazing. And I think one of the veterinary schools at um, also back to Oregon State is studying their behavior department is studying this dog because they find it fascinating that he can learn certain words and learn the buttons that are associated with those words. For example, when he wants food, he can hit the button that says food and he knows where it is. And what's more interesting, they move the buttons around. So you, it's not by the place of buttons. It's actually what the button says. So uh, pretty cool. This is new and very important, by the way. So as you remember, months and months ago, this whole grain-free craze was dropped on its behind because there was a link between grain-free diets and DCM, dilatative cardiomyopathy, or, all right, in dogs. And this was a type of cardio cardiomyopathy that cats would get because of taurine deficiency. Dogs, however, typically make their own taurine. It's in a sulfur amino acid combined with cysteine and methionine. They make their own taurine. And therefore, there was always enough in the foods they were eating in their own bodies to make that, that all they needed between the three amino acids, they made their own taurine. Never a problem. Now, all of a sudden, with grain-free, it was becoming a problem. So, of course, they didn't know exactly what it was, but there was some connection. They thought maybe whatever was being put in the foods to substitute the grains, like legumes, maybe didn't have enough of the building block amino acids. That was a thought. And then they tested those foods, and they did. Um, maybe there was something blocking the formula. So there's a, a cascade to go from one to the other in the production of the taurine from the cysteine and methionine, and maybe that was the problem. So that 
they're not maybe not good case. They it was have, we haven't heard a lot about it in the last few months. So now new studies and they're trying to again find out what is the link. And they found that grain substitute, as I said, may be uh, not providing the building blocks. But many of the dogs studied that had the DCM had plenty of taurine, so there was something else. They also found this is something interesting that many of the patients having this problem that are on grain free were also fed foods produced by smaller companies. And maybe there's something in the shortcuts taken in the production. Um, who knows? But anyway, that might be the issue. So if you're going to feed grain-free, I still don't recommend it. But remember, you're anthropomorphizing. You're staying away from grains. So you might have a you know gluten allergy, therefore my dog must have. No, 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 no. In fact, very, 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 very small amount have any issues with grains. So grains are fine. Do they, interestingly, do they need them? How much of a dog's diet needs to be grain? The answer really is zero, but they do provide protein, source of protein, and some energy. Uh, they're carbs. So I still think it's good to have. You don't have to overload it with grains, with carbs, but you do, you do want some. Anyway, keep that in mind, but uh, I would still, uh, my recommendation is feed something with grain. And, and there are a lot of support out there for doing so as well. Well, let's see. Oh, uh, we talked, um, oh God, several weeks ago about the dogs that are being taught to sniff out COVID-19. Well, the first phase of the studies are over. The results have not been published yet, but but they did move to phase two. Now, if there were not favorable results in phase one, yeah, I think they'd be spending the money on a phase two. So they're testing the skin, they're testing clothing, but there is something out there and dogs are recognizing it. So we're going to know more after phase two. But I think, again, that is pretty cool stuff. Oh, so uh, when I go to the trade shows, I see a lot of these. So there are kits that you can do that you can train your cat to go to the bathroom on a toilet. And what they do is a number of ways to do it. One is you put like a, a little attachment on your toilet with litter, all right? And they poop in the litter. What does a cat typically do after they poop in a litter? They cover it up, all right? So they would cover it up. Then it got to the point where you would lower this bin with the litter in it, lower deeper, deeper into the toilet where the cat would still go in it, but it couldn't cover it up anymore until the point where you they do this enough that you don't even need the kit anymore and you've trained your cat to poop and be in the toilet. Now, what they're finding is as a behaviorist, this veterinarian, I think it's at Penn, he is studying this and he finds that there's some cats, even though they will do it, they don't want to do it once that litter is uh, out of reach or when they can cannot cover the, the urine or the feces. And what's happening is now they're electing not to go when they have to go. And that can be very dangerous as far as backup in the system of either urine or feces. So don't be so fast. You know, cats like litter. There's some great litters out there. Their sustainable yours is one of my favorite. It's corn kernel. It's not corn husk. It's the best clumping thing I've ever used. And um, you can even flush it if you want. But anyway, there are some good ones out there. So talk to your veterinarian, but don't be so in such a haste to train your cat to use the toilet. I mean, yeah, it's great for social media. You can take some great pictures of it. You can boast about it, but let him have his letterbox. Here's another link. We talked about the coronaviruses that we deal with. So there is an antiviral drug used to treat FIP, feline infectious peritonitis, which is a coronavirus. And it, they find, the researchers are finding that that drug is also preventing the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, which is the, the agent, the, the virus in COVID-19, from replicating in cells. So that means that if they can stop the replication, basically you're going to stop the virus. And uh, it's very effective in cats with FIP. We see the, the halt within two weeks. So of course, that drug is now being tested on the human side to see if, um, if we have some sort of activity against the COVID-19. And one last thing, before we go on break, and that is the number of households in the U.S. with pets is up 4%, up to nearly 71 million households, 39% of a dog, or at least one dog, 24% of a cat. Now, remind me, there's some overlap, of course. 11% um, have either fish, a bird, reptiles, hamsters, or rabbits. So if it was only one, which I'm sure it's not, you know, like I, I'm a family with both dog and cat, so you can't count me twice. But it's certainly over 50%, probably 60% of households in America have pets. There are more households in America with pets than there are with children. 
take that one to your uh, breakfast cereal. Anyway, uh, we'll be back after these short messages. Don't go away. Looking for a dental treat that does more for your dog? Daily Dose is a two-in-one chew that pairs a daily dental scrub with powerful supplements to help with the biggest health concerns facing our dogs. Daily Dose was developed by vets to be simple to use and super effective. Plus, dogs love the taste. Available for joint, skin, heart health, or calming. Daily Dose, your pet's daily dose of awesome. Visit yourpetsdailydose.com to save $3 on your first bag with promo code PETLIFE. That's yourpetsdailydose.com. I have a chocolate cocker spaniel named Lady and a blackmouth cur, and it's a lot of responsibility owning a dog. My dogs don't have any health problems because they're eating what they need to eat. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Dynavite is like pouring a multivitamin right onto their food. We'll be scooping our Dynavite, then squirting the liquor chops and the fish oil. They start salivating. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. I get my Dynavite at D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Are you listening to this right now with a cell phone clenched between your teeth as you frantically flip pages on your paper calendars? Or are you a new breed of groomer, bred for speed and efficiency of movement? 123 Pet Software automates your communications, doing the reminding, confirming, thanking, and marketing for you. 123 Pet centralizes your schedule, employees, clients, inventory, and more. 123 Pet is the business management software you need. Start minding your business today. Visit 123petsoftware.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> And welcome back. You're here live with Dr. Jeff Werber. You're your host on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. And, you know, COVID, obviously, a terrible thing. Um, I'm amazed that we're still seeing new cases, even in my uh, area, my community. Um, but uh, there, it, it's been somewhat good for a few things. Um, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but shelters are getting empty. People are adopting pets. People are lonely. They're stuck at home. And that's a good thing. Um, Telemedicine, booming. I've been like, talking about telemedicine for a long time. My AirVet and other, other companies out there are booming as well. Um, vet hospitals, because the increase in number of vets, the good news is they need to see vets. The bad news is vets, because of, because of COVID, social distancing and, and curbside, they're not as efficient. So, we're, I mean, people can call a vet. I hear it all the time. They could not get into a vet for three weeks. That's, that's insane to me. So, um, that's where the telemedicine comes in. One thing that I've been having this talk again and again and again, and I really think it needs some clarification. And that is because uh, people are getting pets, getting them young, and I see the paperwork, whether it's a breeder, whether it's a shelter, rescue, whatever. And it's talking about the, um, first of all, vaccines. Do not tell people if you do this to do and you work with uh, vet rescues, you don't need six week old vaccines. That is going to be hurting the pet. You do not need to start vaccines until they're eight weeks, unless you know for a fact they were abandoned at birth, never had a chance to even get nurse or colostrum. Then you might want to do some, some passive immunity, uh, get some sort of colostrum and um, start vaccines maybe a, a tad early, but normally eight weeks, even if they just had Two days of nursing, that's enough. That's going to give them enough protection until eight weeks. When puppies get or kittens get passive immunity from mother, and then you give a vaccine too early, all you're going to do is eat up the immunity that mom gave them. So those are the antibodies. You do not want to ruin, use those antibodies. Those antibodies are going to see the vaccine, think it's the real thing, and they're going to attack it. Once an antibody attacks an antigen, which is the vaccine, it's out of circulation. It's done. So... And you have an animal that's too young to have make, make its own. That doesn't start till close to eight weeks. So therefore, don't give vaccines too early. Ideal schedule, 8, 12, 16, twist my arm, 7, 11, 15. You don't want to finish a series before four, um, 15 weeks of age, preferably at 16 weeks of age. So if they give enough, I see these, you know, I get the records. And I'm saying, oh my, what are they doing every two weeks, every three weeks? 
And they say, oh, we just gave the final shot. The dog is 13 or 14 weeks. No, you need another one at 17 or 18 weeks. So it is very, very frustrating. But here's another thing that's very frustrating. And this is where I get to be in my soapbox. When to neuter, when to spay. First of all, to do it before, let's take small breeds. Small breeds. You can do it at six months. Absolutely. The studies show that that's okay. However, to do it at four months, all right, is insane. Why? Because many small breeds suffer from what's called retained deciduous teeth. These are baby teeth that haven't fallen out. Fall, fallen out. These are teeth that need to be extracted. And guess what? They need to be anesthetized in order to extract them. So if you knock a dog out at four months and neuter or spay, there's a really good chance you're going to have to anesthetize them again eight weeks later. For what? What reason? So no reason. So do not spay them or neuter them before at least all their adult teeth are in so you can evaluate which of the baby teeth are still in as well and need to be pulled, and you do it all at the same time. Exceptions, some of the rescues will not allow them to go into homes before they're spayed and neutered, and I get it. I get that. So in that case, you're just going to have to deal with it. But typically, if you have control, if you can wait, wait until all the adult teeth are in. Typically, that's at six months. Is there a concern with females? No, because the first female heat said usually it's seven months. So you still have time if you are trying to spay them before the first heat. Now, let's talk large breeds. Large breeds, large breed older dogs often can get bone cancer. Bone cancer is pretty much a death sentence. It's very expensive to treat. Even if you get it early, you're looking at amputation or a limb sparing procedure. You're looking at chemotherapy. And even still, you're not going to go very long. So there was a study done on Rottweilers. Now, Rottweilers are obviously a big breed. And like many of the big breeds, are, you know, will get bone cancer. And they found in the female a 35% greater incidence in long bone cancer in those females that were pre-puberty spayed, meaning spayed young, and a 65% increase in males that were pre-puberty neutered. That's insane. So what it tells us is now... Could this only be something in Rottweilers? Yeah, it could. But this was a retroactive, long-term, three- or four-year study, and following these dogs, going through thousands of statistics, and this is what they came up with. So in order to expect that's going to happen on every large breed dog, and before you make a decision, that's ludicrous. That's insanity. So we have to learn. Uh, the way I look at it is a Rottie's a big breed, okay? Big breeds get bone cancer. So and no more incidents on the Rottweiler. They just use that as the model. So is it likely that it's only something for the Rottweiler answers? No, not in my book. Ask yourself another question. Let's say it is. What's the damage to waiting until they're about 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 months before you spay or neuter, all right, versus what's the potential damage if we're wrong and it's not just in Rottweilers? Well, the answer to that is clear. So there's no downside to waiting unless, unless you have, as I said, a really fractious dog and the, the trainer says you got to fix them. Yeah, there are going to be exceptions. But typically, there, there's no reason you can't wait. And yet, if you're wrong, and it is other breeds too, then you're risking the bone cancer. 65% in the male, 35% in the female. Let's talk about the mammary cancer in females. Yes, the max protection if you spay them before the first heat. But you know what? If they have one heat and you get them before the second, there's still a good risk prevention. So I would do a female at 12 or 13 months, a big breed. Males, now I tell males, wait 18 to 24 months. There's no downside. You want them to be fully mature. So clearly, as in the Rottweiler, which is why there shouldn't be any difference in any breed, there, that any dog that's prone to bone cancer that's in the genes, that there must be some protective benefit to testosterone exposure or estrogen exposures, the sex hormones, that affects that bone, that protects that bone later in life from developing bone cancer. So don't let your vet talk you into anything. Let them read the study. All right. I, I believe it came out of Purdue, but it's printed and it is early spay neuter, the effects on bone cancer in large breed dogs, well, on Rottweilers. And um, what I would do is wait. And I tell my clients all the time, unless you have another good reason, either you can't get it until you're spay neutered. That's usually typical when they're very young, or you have a very, very nasty male dog that male Akita, that male Chow Chow, that male Rhodesian Ridgeback that are known to be pretty tough. And the trainer 
who you're spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars for says, no, you got to get them fixed. Then you get them fixed. Then it's a pro con because if you don't fix them, you're going to end up having to give them up and put them to sleep for aggression way before bone cancer is going to hit. So you got to, you got to weigh that too. And the females, you might want it to have, let them have that one heat. But after that, you want to make sure that you spay them around anywhere from 11 to 13 months of age. All right. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining me here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Best Doctor. If you need to get a hold of me, first of all, follow me on Instagram at, at Dr. Jeff Werber. You can contact me here at Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com. Uh, you can reach me on my AirVet platform um, via Jeff's Telehospital. Um, and um, anything in between. What's with, and also send us an email. If there's anything, a subject that, that is plaguing you, something you're going through with your pet right now, and you just want to know more. You want to know more than your vet has time to give you, especially now, because vets don't have a lot of time to give you, and they're not going to meet you face-to-face. So um, please send me a note, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks for joining me. Have a great, great uh, Labor Day tomorrow. Happy Labor Day to everybody. And if you're in Southern California or anywhere like that's having a heat wave like I am, first of all, stay cool and keep an eye on your pets. Have a great week. See you next week. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.